God didn't make me do this for me to sit there and go, oh yeah, that's a great idea. <laughs> he pushed me into this so I could do something. Those thoughts and prayers and no action, that's all they are. Faith, in other words, and action is endless. America has a gun violence problem. As gun technology has evolved, the amount of weapons in circulation has increased. There are officially more guns than people in the United States, and the number of gun-related deaths has risen each year over the last decade. In 2019, there were more mass shootings than days in the year. When gun-related tragedies are discussed on a national level, there's one phrase that comes up over and over again, thoughts and prayers. Thoughts and prayers has become a buzz phrase, often said by politicians to deflect from answering pressing questions about life-saving policy. It's easy to see why many people are disillusioned with organized religion when a phrase associated with widespread inaction is tied to a belief in God. And as mass shootings have taken the main stage in national conversation, it begs the question, what about the communities who have been dealing with localized gun violence for decades? To Chicago now, where at least 38 people were shot. 41 shootings. 63 people. 52 people. This year alone, more than 2,100 people have been shot. Chicago is one of America's most vibrant cities, a mainstay of business, art, and cultural influence. Chicago is also one of America's most segregated cities. Black and brown neighborhoods are consistently underserved due to a long history of institutionalized racism. Faced with public school closures and inadequate funding of public works, high rates of gun violence persist, hitting the south and west sides of Chicago the hardest. In 2019 alone, there have been over 450 gun-related deaths in Chicago. We're in a state of emergency in my community. We got our babies dying every day. And yet, people here aren't waiting for politicians to help their communities, and they're certainly not placing value on empty cliches. They're taking action now. Church leaders, congregations, and people of faith are some of the most active Chicago citizens mobilizing in grassroots efforts to end gun violence. Fight, this is a story of what comes after Thoughts and Prayers. One church stepping up is St. Sabina, a Catholic faith community in the Auburn-Gresham neighborhood of Chicago. The Chicago Police Department is hosting a gun buyback here at the church. There's a line around the block of people lining up to bring their guns in, and apparently the line has been there since they started at 10 a.m. this morning, and the buyback will continue until this afternoon. They can bring their guns, no questions asked. You bring them five, you get $500. You bring them one, you get $100. They bring their gun in, and so we can get them off our streets. This is Pam Bosley. Her son Terrell was shot and killed while unloading instruments for choir practice in a church parking lot. He was 18 years old. Pam is the co-founder of an organization called Purpose Over Pain, a network of parents who've lost children to gun violence. They organize neighborhood events and do local outreach, all while advocating for safer communities. Believe me, me and God had a lot of talks because I was, I couldn't understand why he allowed my son not to be here. I asked him why all the time, like, why God, really? You got me here, and I tried to take my life twice that first year. I wonder if you can tell me a little bit about why it was important for the church to be so involved in gun violence in such a very practical way. You come to church as a huddle. It's like football. When you huddle, after that you go out and you do action. No matter how hard I mean, my husband worked to keep our family safe, if I don't reach out and grab the rest of the people around me, this can't continue to happen, and I have two more sons I'm fighting for. And St. Sabine is a vegan um, home in this community, and it's a light, and that's what the church is supposed to be about. It's supposed to be a light in the community. St. Sabina has become a neighborhood hub, serving as a home base for several programs committed to lessening gun violence and supporting the community. I think America has a love affair with guns. It's become part of American wardrobe, and uh, it's a business. Violence is a business. This is Father Flager, the senior pastor at St. Sabina. You may have seen him in the news last year when he led a gun violence protest that shut down a major Chicago freeway. We're not turning back while our, while our children are dying. And while Father Flager is seen by some as controversial, everyone that we spoke with during our visit emphasized the positive impact he's had in their lives. When you hear someone like tweet out or say that they're offering thoughts and prayers. It after makes me a sick. 
Yeah. Because faith without action and works is dead. I believe in the power of prayer. But then you've got to get up from your knees and make the word flesh. What is like the access that a community of faith has to affect change within their community? Social justice is the DNA of the Bible and of Jesus. His ministry was all outside the church. Where do we lose that? A lot of times I see churches that have great mission stuff overseas, but not right outside the front door. In my mind, the most revolutionary person that ever lived was Jesus Christ. He challenged the government and his harshest criticism was for the church. We call them hypocrites and vipers. If we're not willing to be the lobbyists for the poor, the disenfranchised, the forgotten, the alienated, if we're not willing to be that, then shut down your church, your mosque, your synagogue. Either we live this gospel or we should stop preaching it. When the stakes are this high, it's important for activists, organizers, and members of the impacted communities to have access to the mental health resources and care that they need. We met with Camille Williams, a congregational organizer and activist who's lost over 30 people in her life to gun violence. 2016 was one of the worst years of my life, period. I lost five people that year. Students, cousins, friends. I didn't know nothing about trauma. Like, I believe there is no space for people like myself to come and say, I want to die, I don't want to die. I want to die because I don't want to feel this pain. I represent Trump. I have a voice to talk about it. And I try to talk about it in all honesty. I think that a lot of churches just need to be more trauma informed. You do not often see a faith leader taking such a public stance on an issue that as of now has become political. We're talking about social justice issues, period. We're talking maternal mortality, health care, education, housing, things that affect your congregation. Let's figure out how we can be a church outside of the four walls. Over in the North Lawndale neighborhood, we heard about a pastor who's dedicated his life to giving young people an alternative to the streets. Here we go. This is the picture where the guys used to sleep. Firemen used to sleep here, right? So the war's all different. Right? I just love the image of you walking in here and being like, and this will be a dance studio. And right. People are like, what? And you're like, no, 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 it will. Right. It will be a dance studio. <laughs> right. I see it. Pastor Phil Jackson bought and renovated a vacant firehouse, turning it into a multifaceted art center. Kids can come here to learn life skills, discover their creativity, get a warm meal, or just have a safe space to talk about what's on their mind. I love this artwork, so all heaven awaits the moment youth will arise and act on behalf of their generation. It's a, a constant reminder why we do what we try to do and who we're trying to impact. So it is when young people feel that they have the permission to do that. See, in the hood, people don't need permission to shoot somebody. People don't need permission to run wild in school, smoke weed, fight a teacher, break stuff up. But you need permission to be a genius. You need permission to be brilliant. You need permission to know that you count. It's the opposite, right? Where other communities have so many safeguards and strengths around them that people already walk into the fact that I am and have this opportunity to be this way. Do you ever get discouraged like serving in this community? Yeah, yeah. It's a lot of discouragement at the same time that there was a lot of, lot of hope. And that's the juxtaposition that, uh, that we live in. We spoke to Firehouse staff member Jason Little. Jason was a victim of gun violence. When he was just 21 years old, he was shot seven times. I was paralyzed from the neck down. I was thinking to myself like, you know, my life is over. Jason eventually regained his ability to walk, but spent years homeless and struggling to find work. With the help of Pastor Phil, Jason was able to turn his life around. How does your faith inform the work that you're doing here? We talk about it, but I think when the media comes around and the cameras are around, I think then you see all the, the church folks come out because of the, the publicity that comes with it. I mean, it's not all churches are bad, but I just think if more, 188 churches in all congregation came out, more than just when the media is around, how much effect that can have on the community. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of times we see a lot of hypocrisy from politics and we see a lot of hypocrisy and lip service from communities of faith with regards to sensitive issues like gun violence. The people we've met with, they belong to communities that aren't waiting for bills to get passed. They aren't waiting for the right politician to get funded by the right donor to say the right thing. Like they're doing the right things now. 
So just how much of a positive impact can one person make on their community? I'm great. Yeah, you are. I'm starting to meet you. Thank you so much for having us. We went to meet with Diane Latiker, who runs the nonprofit Kids Off the Block from her living room. Her program provides young people with alternatives to a life on the street. So Kids Off the Block is a community-based organization that helps young people get out of gangs, homeless kids, and kids get back in school. And we do that through conventional programming like tutoring and mentoring, conflict resolution sports, but we're more unconventional yeah. <laughs> as long as we can keep them on the right track and take the power of the gun out of their hand. And we're doing this like from your home. Yes. Like this started... I forgot that part. <laughs> I was going to say, it's not just like, when you're like, it's unconventional, I was like, well, it's unconventional <laughs> in a lot of ways. We are inside of your living room right yeah. now. And this started yeah. because you just opened your door. Just opened the door. And and that's what I, I, I actually emphasize that with everybody. Uh, it, hurt, it didn't hurt me and my husband to open the door. It didn't. I mean, well, it caused some conflict once they got in here, but... <laughs> Diane just opened her door one day, offering homework help to the kids on her block. Shortly thereafter, hundreds of kids started flocking to her front door. She's since received awards, met with senators, and helped countless kids escape violence. So why did you open the door? To this day, um, I have to attribute it to God, and I do. I mean, it's a huge risk. It is, and it still is. And I've lost young people to violence, which sheds your whole soul. I was going to so many funerals, I had to stop. It was killing me. Like, what d sort of practical changes would you like to see from more members of your community? They say, Diane, we believe you. We believe you that the 16 to 19 year olds need job skills, lifetime skills. So we're gonna help you build this center next door, this technology entrepreneurship center, so you can have real skills. We're gonna listen to what they need. And then we're gonna back you to give it to them. And I take all of these off if I could get that. And I could see a hundred young people with the, their hopes and dreams being realized because that would change my whole community. Across the street from Diane's house, she's built a memorial for the lives lost to gun violence in Chicago. It's a sobering visual reminder of the violence facing this community every day. 16 year old on a student. There's a, a one year old in here who's getting a diaper change and they were trying to kill her father and one of the minutes it hurt. We just don't want their memories to be lost because I'm outraged that there is no outrage because they're black and brown young people. Denzel! While there, we met one of the kids from Diane's program, Denzel. Where are your shoes at, dude? I it's when it's at in the car. You're just naked with socks. <laughs> well, we're so used to it, like, yeah. I'm wondering if you could maybe tell us a bit about what Kids Off the Block means to you. Like when you when you come to Kids Off the Block, it's, it's, it's a family-based situation. Like you feel the love, you feel the encouragement, you feel the help, yeah. trust, trust and believe. And so what's next for you? Um, I'm going off to college. I'm a major in criminal justice and uh, go into policing, the law enforcement, so I can change the stereotyping that the police and the community have against each other. You're yeah. going to come back to Chicago? Yes, of course. What is something that you want people to know about Kids Off the Block, about what the, the work that Miss Diane is doing here? You can find love, you can find help, you can find whatever you need. This is more like a family, literally. If you... Well, I'm looking yeah, do it, do it. This is your moment. <laughs> if you ever find yourself in a situation where you need help or you can't get out of the situation, Miss Diane Latica will, and most unfortunately, help you with everything she got. Oh. This is the third year in a row that gun-related deaths in Chicago have decreased. And while this statistic can't be attributed to a single source, I think it's an encouraging sign about the work being done here to create real and lasting change. Change that cannot be measured by sympathetic retweets or political owns, but by life-saving community activism. The faith I encountered in Chicago goes well beyond 140 characters or less. This is tangible faith in action. And if your faith is anything less, then what is it for and who does it serve? Anyway, until next time, thoughts and prayers, my friends. Thank you for watching Refinery29. For more videos, click here. And to subscribe, click here.